morning and welcome to Generación Latina, your host here, Carolina Peña. And tonight's show, we, I am so excited to bring you Fashion with Passion, or should I say Pasión? Because tonight's guest is a young entrepreneur from, ve from our very own Montgomery County here in Rockville. She's the owner uh, and fashion designer of The Red Hue. And with us here is Sylvia Hueso. Very nice to have you here. Thank you, Carolina. And Sylvia, you have accomplished so much. You're very young. You just graduated from university, I think, a few years ago. But I'm very, very curious to just see w how you've taken all these steps that have gotten to you, that have gotten you where you are today, which is not only uh, a successful fashion designer and you know still with a lot more to ahead, but also uh, an entrepreneur. So tell me more about you. Well, um, well, just a little bit of uh, background. I grew up in Tacoma Park here in Montgomery County. I went to Montgomery Blair High School, and uh, I went to Marymount in Arlington, Virginia. So most of the things I've done are local. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was actually born in El Salvador, and I, I came here with my parents um, when I was six years old. So this is pretty much you know, where I, I grew up. But of course, I do love going back home and everything like that. And um, I went to school for fashion design. So um, I, you know, it was always my interest um, to maybe have my own business. I didn't really want to do the New York thing and, you know, do like the big gowns and all that. I wanted to do something more local, more independent. Tell me about that, um, where it all began. You know, was it, did you know this when you were really young, you were really into dressing up, or was it later? I think it was later. When I was in high school, um, I was so obsessed with being different and being unique. How are you different when you were Well, I didn't want to look like everybody else. So I didn't like the cookie cutter image and I didn't want to like want to wear like the sneakers and the tight jeans and like the tight shirts everybody else was wearing. I wanted to do something completely different. So I figured, well, what's what's going to make me real different? My clothes. Um, and how can I control that? Making my own clothes. So when I was in high school, my mom bought me a uh, sewing machine and I, you know, my aunts just kind of taught me how to cut a little bit and how to, um, just basic sewing skills. Um, but pretty much the rest I kind of self-taught myself. And like the first thing I made was a tutu or something. But <laughs> So that's sort of how the, the skill in creating clothing kind of came mm -hmm. about. And then there's your entrepreneurial spirit. Tell me about that. Yeah, well, um, I think that may be inherited a little bit because my parents have been businesses themselves and just um, in high school is when they started that process and I kind of started it with them um, but also because I had the great opportunity of taking an entrepreneurship course in high school um, and I just had I had such a great um, teacher and you know it really encouraged us to kind of find what we're passionate for and and see how we could make a you know, a business out of it. And they gave us the opportunity to sell our products at the school store and all that. So I would, like, you know, make pajama pants and skirts and things like that, and I would sell them at the school store. So you, you were making money in high school. I mean, <laughs> this is great. This is where the success begins. So did you have a specific interest in designing um, clothes for women, uh, maybe using certain colors, or kind of how did you begin to explore um, design? Well, um, I mean, again, like a lot of it was for myself when I first started, and I would make a lot of like easy, like knit things that I could just put on because I could, I didn't know how to put a zipper on until <laughs> you know I, I went to um, to college and actually learned how to do that. So a lot of it was just yeah, like very just simple things, and then I really got into like very classic cut things, and even in in college, I was um, most of my stuff was very like classic cut with like these little like twists of things. And um, initially, I wanted to do junior. Um, I wanted to design like a junior brand um, for you know like teenagers and things because I thought it was. It, I just thought it was going to be more fun, but um, it's actually a little bit more challenging. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. And did you see yourself sort of creating? clothing and then putting it in like Macy's or Lauren Taylor or how or did you want to have sort of like your own avenue for these things? I did, I, yeah I did want and I still do actually hope to someday have um, you know my clothes in, in other uh, stores, other retailers. Um, so that was the idea you know to design a brand that I would be able to sell um, you know to other retailers and the idea of having my own 
um, boutique didn't emerge until the end of college, when talking to my parents, well, you know, what do you want to do? Um, you want to do business, you want to do design, do you want to do a label, a brand, what do you want to do? So we ended up just trying to go for both and see how, how it would work out. <laughs> wow, ambitious, definitely ambitious. Now, what were, as you were coursing through high school, and even, I mean, certainly college, what were some of the main, um, you say, obstacles that you felt like you had to you know, overcome in order to get to, you know, having your own business, having your own design brand? Well, uh, I mean, obstacles are many. I mean, I face obstacles every day still. I mean, this is just, this is just the beginning for me. I mean, I I've, I've pretty much have a lot more challenges um, ahead of me. But I think um, the biggest obstacles um, were, for me, were at least not being confident enough in the items that I was um, designing mm -hmm. um, and just maybe being too much a per of a perfectionist when it came to the actual garments. I remember in college if, oh my gosh, if like the item wasn't correct, you know, the way that I thought it should look like, I would start the whole thing over. I mean, even if it was like due the next day, I would start the whole thing over until it was exactly how I wanted it. and. A lot of times that slowed me down and it just put more pressure on me. Um, and I mean, obstacles are many. You get, you get people that, you know, don't want to pay attention to you because you're young and, you know, they don't take you seriously or, you know, they, they think you're just fooling around or, I mean, I think that's, that's also another challenge. Mm -hmm. Did you have a mentor? Did you have somebody to... Teach you. I mean, you sort of mentioned your your family and yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, my my parents absolutely are the number one, um, you know, people that I go to for advice, whether it's business or you know, even in life, of course. Um, so, absolutely, my parents are the number one, mm -hmm. the number one mentors for me. And I'm curious also to learn a little more about the process of design. So, you know, do you, where do you get your inspiration? Is it something you completely think of your head or do you put ideas together differently? Like, I'm, I'm curious, because I know that there's so many, so many students that do have great ideas but never actually turn them into action. So how do you get from an idea to a finished product? Uh, well, I mean, I think I used to, when I first started designing, it was always, maybe it was a picture, maybe it was, a theme or something like that, but I think um, more recently I'm just I I get inspired by my actual customer, what they actually want. So a lot of times they'll say, you know, I really love purple, and I think, okay, purple. Well, I go out and I look to see if what kind of purple prints jump at me, and you know, things like that. Or I like things with sleeves. Well, what's a nice sleeve? What's a nice cut? You know, things like that. So. More, more than anything now, because it's a business, um, and I think of it more as a product now, um, whereas before I was just making these, like, designing in my head, these, like, crazy things with, like, huge bows and whatnot and all these different colors. Um, and I think that's the fun part of it. Um, but then you have to kind of take that, that idea and kind of break it down when you actually want to sell it and make it into a product. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a very different dynamic. It is, and I think, you know, students or, I mean, just, just about anybody that is looking to produce something artistic, whether that would be music or, you know, literature, whatever it would be, there's this creative extreme, and then there's what people will read, what people exactly. will wear, exactly. what they will listen to. So exactly. kind of like having to go mainstream yeah. is something that you also would have to deal with as, yeah. a, as a designer, exactly. especially if you're in business. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, you, you watch these shows on TV, right, where they're designing, they have all these designers, and um, at the end, you know, they have the judges that tell them, okay, well, that is actually going to sell, or that's not going to sell. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like, yeah, it's one of the challenges, that's one of the things that you have to consider when you want to actually sell your product. And you're sent, like you said, to the, to like, in mainstream, you're trying to sell it to, to the masses or people, you know, just an everyday woman who's not going to wear like a big bow, you know, back there or on the hips or oh no, because it's going to add to it and, you know, or I don't like this color because it makes me, you know, it doesn't blend with my skin and things like that. So. And I, it also takes an understanding of who you're selling to, right? I mean, you're, we're kind of outside Washington, D.C. It's more conservative, mm -hmm. you know, if you mm -hmm. design 
crazy things in New York and sell them, right? Yeah. For a lot of money. Yeah. But it is different. It is a different, it's a different market. And yeah. you wanted to stay here in this market. Tell me more about why, what kept you here. Um, well, for me, uh, staying in the area was mainly my family. That was the, the main reason. I'm very, very family oriented. So even when I chose um, where I was going to go to school, I made sure it was somewhere where I could commute, um, that I was still be able to be close to my family. I also because I, I was helping them with their business and all of that. But I'm just just very family oriented. I mean, I was going to miss my mom's cooking. I mean, oh my gosh, mm, like I would course. I would die without the you know frijoles and tortillas and queso duro. <laughs> That's a good reason to stay. <laughs> yeah. That is a very I good think so. <laughs> <laughs> and to have their support. I mean, absolutely. What you're doing does take a lot of just self impetus, sort of. You yeah. Know. No. And you need and you need people to back you up and kind of support you with with all that. And they, I, they are my biggest supporters. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And my boyfriend, he's just always there. I mean, he absolutely hates fashion, but <laughs> he, he's always there. He's like, we need to take pictures, I'll take pictures, you he know, I'll fashion, be there. He loves you, right? Yeah, exactly. So. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Now, how would a, you know, and, and we only have a few minutes and then we'll, we'll get right back and I definitely want to hear more about, about your business, what you're doing locally, but one of the things that I want to know is, you know, how would a student who's interested in, in maybe even specifically fashion design, how, how, where would they start, you know? Because, I mean, are they, should they buy a sewing machine or, or what should they do? Right. Well, if you're interested in fashion design and studying um, fashion design, I suggest that, yeah, absolutely, first thing, get a sewing machine. Um, you know, take stuff apart and see how it's constructed because a lot of times that's, uh, I mean, it's the, you know, one of the biggest things when it comes to design, you can have this wonderful idea of things hanging off of the shoulders and whatnot, but if you don't know how you would actually construct it, then you have no way of telling someone how to actually make it and then have the end product. Mm -hmm. So construction, absolutely. I mean, get a sketch pad, take pictures, just start like a, a journal and, you know, just paste pictures in there, you know, draw, I mean, whatever inspiration. Um, you get put it in a book. Cool. Yeah. That's a that's a good start. You know, yeah. it's manageable. It doesn't seem that out there, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing everything you have so far. We're going to be right back, and I, I do like I said. I just want to hear a lot more about you know how do we how do we take inspiration? How do we run with ideas? Um, turn them into a business? You know, whatever that would be. And, uh, and even some of the things, some of the struggles that you've gone through. You know, you're, you're a Latina, you've got some really big ideas, you love your family. I think a lot of people can relate to that. So we will be right back. Stay with us. And as always, don't forget generacionlatina.org. <laughs> Cook foods to the right temperature using a food thermometer. 3,000 Americans will die from food poisoning this year. Keep your family safer. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov. And we're back with Generación Latina here. And our guest this evening, Silvia Hueso, the owner and designer of The Red Hill. I am thrilled to, to also get a better sense of what reality is like for a fashion designer. You know, when, when we're young and we think of all these possibilities if somebody's interested in fashion and they want to design and you know you think of the runways you think of the popularity the paparazzi whatever that might be but Sylvia here is going to give us a little bit of a more realistic picture right of what it's like so tell me I mean you run a business you've got employees you've got clothing that you need to put up take down whatever like what is it like from you know sunrise to sunset Oh, it's hectic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, we have days where if we have an event, for example, last Friday we had an event um, with the city of Rockville, and it was crazy from the beginning of the day until the end of the day. Because we, we're trying to run the store, we're trying to prepare models, we're trying to prepare clothing, steaming, you know, and then making sure that the store is still, you know, being kept clean and that, you know, the customers are still being, and all of this is going on at the same time wow. in the same place. We have models that are getting their hair done in the back, and then we have, 
you know, a few girls that are steaming, and then another girl is, you know, trying to run the store, and then I'm running around. Um, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy. So you had a, a pretty key role in this fashion, um, this fashion event, which was actually about uh, healthy hearts, right? Right. And, and right. women. It's right. Exactly. Promoting healthy hearts. Um, in the Latino women community. Exactly. So yeah, we, I mean, we were one of the sponsors um, and we got to show um, a few of the dresses that we have at the shop. Exciting. Now, and then, you know, what would you say are some of the bigger challenges that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, I mean, n the biggest challenge for us now is getting our name out there, I guess, because, I mean, this b the boutique just opened back in February, so a lot of people don't know about it yet. and. Um, you know, just trying to make sales, honestly, and uh, getting people to make actual purchases are probably, like, the biggest challenge right now. Right. Yeah. Well, I think a lot more will now know about your, <laughs> about your, your, everything that you're doing, but, you know, especially Red Hue in the middle of, right in the heart of the, the Rockville Town Square. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, tell me about this specific dress. Kind of like um, how did it come about? Well, this dress is a sample for um, what may become a uh, spring or early winter. Um, we had the, I well, I had the idea of um, just uh, something with a classic cut uh, that would um, fit different um, body types that was, you know, versatile. And this specific one we made in cotton, stretched cotton, very comfortable, very breathable. And then um, just kind of, it was going to have originally a sash around, and then I figured I don't really want to do that, I want to do something more simple and funky, so we put flowers on there, and then um, I had suggestions that maybe we could sell the dress by itself and then sell different color flowers that you could mix and match, maybe if you like purple and cream, you could do purple and cream, or red and cream, or, you know, green and yellow, who I knows, whatever colors you like, and mix and match, and, um, you know, so... You know that was the idea behind this one. What what would you say is kind of a, a best seller in your store? I mean, do you have a, you know, do you find that a lot of people go for something specific or? Um, I mean, it changes. We get so many, you know, because I carry other brands too, and we get different styles in that sell out, you know, pretty quickly. But I think whatever is cut classic, that is forgiving, that can fit different um, body types. Um, that the color works for different skin tones, a, a versatile dress. They can wear it maybe at a wedding, or they can wear it at the dinner rehearsal, or they can wear it, you know, on a picnic or something, something that can work in, in different um, environments. I think those are usually winners. I think so, too. I mean, that's usually what I shop for. Like, right. Can I wear this for this and this and this right. all together? Yeah. Yes, because we want to get wear out of out of the things that we're, you know, we're paying for. Right. We really want to get wear out of it. Of course, and in this economy, you exactly. absolutely <laughs> to do that. Now, all these dresses, are they produced here? Or where is, you mentioned you have a workshop. Yeah. Well, Red Hue is, um, is manufactured in El Salvador. Um, by a family-owned um, workshop. It's actually my own family that runs it, and it's completely sweatshop-free. Really, it's a very hospital environment. Uh, we visit two or three times a year. Um, I have communication daily with um, the seamstresses and the people in charge. So, and you know, they're just very, very skilled, very, very talented um, seamstresses that just put these things together and I'm sometimes when I get the samples I'm just amazed and I'm like I can't believe you put this together it looks gorgeous right. looks exactly what I Delicious. had envisioned yeah. yeah oh that's so beautiful I mean you're basically employing your own family where you know they have yeah. an amazing opportunity to contribute not just you know in business but to you to your success yeah. you know, and eventually you know we want um, we kind of w want that to become the focus of Red Hue as a brand, mm -hmm. um, you know, just the philanthropy behind it. Um, you know, we would love for the workshop to grow and, you know, be able to employ um, more people, put a lot more people to work back home. And, you know, maybe eventually here, too, um, you know, having manufacturing um, locally, too. That's excellent. That's and then the managing, I mean, how do you manage a team internationally and then here? I mean... Well, it's a network, you know, um, we have the family back home taking care of that and just having communication on a daily level of, of, 
you know, what, what things need to be shipped now, or, you know, did this sample get approved, what needs to be changed, just communication is key. Great. What would you say has been the, the single most um, transformative or Im impactful experience you've had to get you to where you are today, doing what you love? I think moving to Rockville was the biggest thing for me um, because originally the shop was in College Park. It was very small. It was like a basement store. It was completely like, you know, just independent and like very like, you know, bohemian and just very in the cut though. So it wasn't, um, it didn't really work out. And I think that it was either, um, you know, going somewhere where I was going to make it or, you know, just completely giving up and not, not going, not moving forward after that. So that huge challenge and um, just my moving to Rockville and coming to a different clientele and just being able to hear what the customers really wanted and, you know, that, that kind of thing I think was the biggest, the biggest breakthrough we had. Just moving to a place where people were happy and excited to see, um, you know, someone doing something locally, a local designer and, you know, what everything that's, you know, that goes behind Red Hue, just people who are excited and willing and accepting of, of something so different. Absolutely. I think people are more willing to support something that is local and mm -hmm. just like locally grown food. Well, mm -hmm. this is locally made fashion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And not only that, but supporting you know, people in El Salvador. Right. Um, it's, yeah. a, it's a great enterprise that you've created. So I congratulate you. Now, for, for young people wanting to create something, but they feel like they're so alone, like this idea that they have, no one else is going to believe in it. I mean, what would you say to them that they should do? Well, um, you know, first of all, set goals for yourself. I mean, literally write down your goals, what you want to accomplish, and have you know, that basic idea of what you want to do. Okay, this year I want to get straight A's or I want to get A's and B's or want my GPA, you know, when I graduate to be, you know, a 3.4 or whatever. I want to get into the school. I want to go to this school. Just lay a little map out for yourself of what you want to do and where you want to go. Um, and just, you know, don't buy into what society um, says about you or what they um, already think think about you, especially, you know, Latino youth. Um, there's just these horrible misconceptions out there of what a Latino youth is and what they'll, you know, accomplish in life or how little they'll accomplish in life. So I think just breaking through um, that sort of stereotype and just, you know, laying your, 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 your map out of where you want to go and what you want to do um, and just getting also people, you know, the support. A lot of times, um, our parents work too hard and you know they may not be able to be there for us and you know but try to find you know other great adults that can help teachers there's different mentors out there that you know maybe have a little bit more time and you know just just trying to to get um, a support team behind you friends um, a lot of times our friends influence us much more than our parents do and although our parents want us the be want the best for us will be, you know, more willing to listen to a friend and a lot of times friends don't know and friends don't may themselves not have an idea or a plan of what, what they want to do in life. But I think it's just breaking through all of that and, you know, just realizing that you're invincible, that you you can do it absolutely if you set your mind to it, you know. Like when when we're little we're always told, you know, just set your mind to it and you can do it. But I think that you really have to believe it. You really, really have to believe it. Um, you know, we, I, I've talked to a lot of young Latinos and I just, I try to, you know, just tell them don't let society convince you of, um, of who you're supposed to be yeah. or what, you know. Something you're not. Exactly, yeah. which is not. I mean, you know, our ancestry is so rich in culture. I mean, we were warriors, you know, we were mathematicians and I mean, hello. You know, we have all these wonderful things and all these wonderful gifts, and we just got to learn how to use them and, and get the right support team. Exactly. And sometimes, and you mentioned something key, you know, parents don't have time. Sometimes parents don't even support artistic pursuits. 
So what would you say to parents in that situation? Because, yeah, it's, it's kind of a risky path to take, you know, yeah, not Especially in the artistic field. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I think for parents, um, honestly, I would rather have my kid paint, like, the whole living room than have him outside with people I don't even know. So I think a lot of times parents, you know, they just need to be understanding and open-minded that some, you know, some way or other, their, their children um, will be able to be successful with whatever that artistic, um, you know, skill is. I mean, any skill, whether it's music or, you know, art, I mean, you have to, you know, as a parent, feed that and, you know, nurture it and, and have, you know, your child develop in, in, in this field, with, you know, whether it's music or art um, or, you know, maybe they like science or math, just being able to pay attention and, you know, just for five minutes, for ten minutes, just sit with your child and listen to, well, what do you like? You know, that was a great drawing you did. Or, you know, or showing up to, um, uh, you know, your child's maybe um, international show. And, you know, I know a lot of times in high school we'd have international shows and we'd dance and all of that. And we want our parents there. Yeah. We want you to just take that evening off in, that, in the whole year just to come watch us dance, you know, or what, come watch us you know, and see what we painted and see what we drew. Yeah. So just taking that time out. It makes such a huge difference. Absolutely. And, you know, I think you see it years later. You see the fruit of that. But it, it does. Mm -hmm. You know, it makes a huge difference in somebody's life. Mm -hmm. um, before we go, I want to give you the opportunity to sort of tell us where we can find, you know, these, these creations that you're doing and, you know, learn more about not only your, you know, your, um, your business, but, you know, how can we support it and, and then definitely, if you want to mention somebody in specific that you want to thank. Well, um, I guess, well, I, I'll start with that and just who, who I'm thankful for. Um, and definitely my parents, um, my mom, my dad, just, I mean, they are just absolutely wonderful, always supportive, um, a great example of, of parenting, I think, when it comes to, to things like that. And uh, uh, my, my boyfriend, who's, I mean, who's kind of, been very patient and you know now we're supposed to be getting married next year and all that and it's just an, it's just such a challenge yeah. so um, just just very thankful for them and my family my friends who are always there to show up they show up to the shows and all of that and just you know really thankful for, for, for all the good people uh, surrounding me and um, you're welcome to come to the boutique uh, it's in Rockville Town Square um, it's called Red Hue Boutique and um, you can also shop online and check out what we've got online going on online to redheboutique.com. And um, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Tumblr. So we're all over the place. Just look for us. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us. You are so inspiring, and I hope many of you have been inspired as well. Like she said, redheboutique.com, and we'll see you next week. In 1977, an eight-year-old boy picked up the game of golf from his father. The odds of that same boy then making it to the US and European pro golf tours? One in seven million. The odds of the Big Easy winning the US Open twice? One in 1.2 billion. The odds of him having a child diagnosed with autism? One in 150. Ernie Else encourages you to learn the signs at autismspeaks.org. Hands can do incredible things. Now they can even help save a life with hands-only CPR. If you see an adult suddenly collapse, just call 911, then push hard and fast in the center of the chest until help arrives. Learn more at handsonlycpr.org. Sounds like you could use some Van Gogurt. It's fortified with arch-rich nutrients to improve your math and reading skills. Catch. Van Gogurt, thanks. So what's the deal with your ear? Always with the ear, huh? Feed your kids the arts. For 10 simple ways to learn how, visit americansforthearts.org.